The Germans have reached Holland. Good Lord. How on earth did they manage to do that? I could have sworn that they would never break through the Maginot line. Quite right, sir. They didn't. They went round the side. I see. They what? They went round the side. When people talk about the Second World War, something that comes up a lot is the idea that the Maginot Line was a bit of a joke. Built at vast expense to protect France from German invasion, the Maginot was made redundant by the Germans simply going around, or at least that's what you might think if internet memes were anything to go by. It turns out though, the Maginot was perhaps much more successful than you might have first thought. To properly assess the Maginot Line's performance, we need to first understand how it came about and what it was designed to achieve. To do this, we need to go all the way back to 1916 and one of the First World War's most titanic battles, Verdun. Here, for 10 months, the French went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the full might of the German army, and at the cost of over 400,000 men she had won. It was the defining victory of the Great War for France and became an incredibly important symbol for the nation during the 1920s and 30s, similar to how post-war Britain has come to regard Dunkirk and the Battle of Britain as defining moments in its national story. As well as this, the French military drew a number of lessons from its experience at Verdun. First and foremost, the value of strong fortifications. Throughout the battle, forts played a key role. For example, Fort Vaux, which held up an entire German army corps in the opening days of the battle, or Fort Douaumont, which the French lost and then had to spend tens of thousands of lives to get back. These enormous fortresses, too well armoured to be damaged by most artillery, were so influential at Verdun they seemed the ideal way to hold the Germans back in a future conflict. In addition, forts were useful as strong force multipliers, they could enable small numbers of French troops to repel attacks by larger numbers of Germans. This was especially useful for France considering the terrifying demographic disadvantage that she found herself confronted with after the war. In 1919, France had a population of 39 million compared to 59 million Germans. What's more, Germany's population was growing at a much faster rate than France's. In 1935, when those born in 1915 reached conscription age, France could expect 184,000 future soldiers. Germany could expect 464,000. This made it obvious that France couldn't hope to match Germany's numbers in any future conflict and couldn't afford to fight another battle as costly as Verdun. Large-scale fortifications, even greater than those from the First World War, provided a potential solution to this. This was certainly the view of Marshal Philippe Patin, the man who had commanded the French army at Verdun. Patin argued that a continuous line of forts along the entire border with Germany should be built. Appointed Inspector General of the Army in 1922, he was influential in driving French military thinking towards what would become the Maginot Line. By the 1930s, France's politicians had been convinced, giving huge majorities in the French Parliament to begin construction of the line on January 4th, 1930. Costing 7 billion francs and taking 5 years to complete, the Maginot would be named for the incumbent Minister for War during 1931, André Maginot. It was a truly formidable defensive barrier. Up to 12 feet of concrete encased its largest bunkers, housing a vast array of artillery, mortars, anti-tank weaponry and machine guns, all with interlocking fields of fire. It had the effect of making any German advance into Alsace virtually impossible. Of course, the Maginot stopped once it was west of Luxembourg, which left the wide open plains in Belgium and northern France undefended. Now, this wasn't some amateurish mistake, but actually central to French plans for confronting Germany. With the direct border to Germany closed off by the Maginot, the bulk of the French army could advance into Belgium and take up positions on the Meuse River and Albert Canal, which would be fortified in advance by Belgium. This would form a continuous defensive line running from Switzerland to the coast. You may notice that this plan leaves the Ardennes Forest in the centre of this line rather underdefended. Well, so far as Marshal Patin and the rest of the French army were concerned, the area was just not dangerous. With hindsight, we know the bulk of Germany's attack came through this region, so the question remains as to why the French army didn't see the danger. 
Again, this comes back to French experience in the First World War, where tanks and other armoured vehicles struggled to move through difficult terrain, which the Ardennes, with its rolling hills and dense woodland, certainly represented. Considering how difficult attacks of any kind had been on the Western Front during the First War, it was simply inconceivable that the Germans would attempt to push through the Ardennes, so the region was not really a priority. The French hoped that when the Germans attacked they would find themselves hemmed in by strong fortified lines in all viable directions of advance, allowing the Allies to grind their opponents down over time, just like the First War. This approach was made possible by virtue of France's alliance with Belgium, dating back to 1914. With the two nations working closely together, French troops would fight from well-prepared positions occupied weeks in advance. The alliance with Belgium is also why the Maginot only extended along the direct border with Germany. To extend it all the way to the coast and then hide behind it would be to sell the Belgians out, abandoning them to occupation. Instead, when the Maginot was finished in 1935, it formed part of a wider strategy for holding the Germans back. It's the southern end of a network of defensive lines with the Ardennes, an impervious natural barrier, at its centre. Unfortunately, within 12 months of the Maginot's completion, this entire strategy would be in ruins. On March 7th, 1936, the German army marched into the Rhineland in a flagrant repudiation of the Versailles Treaty. It was a direct challenge to France and technically grounds for an intervention to uphold the treaty. But neither France's politicians and especially not Britain's were prepared to go to war over Germany moving troops around inside her borders so the German action was allowed to stand. What wasn't immediately obvious was the effect this had on Belgium's new king, Leopold III. Confronted with German troops again on Belgium's borders and France seemingly unwilling to do anything about it, the Belgian monarch reconsidered his foreign policy. On October 14, 1936, Leopold revoked the Franco-Belgian Treaty, broke the alliance and returned his nation to the policy of neutrality she had adopted prior to 1914. According to Alistair Horn, for France this meant that in the event of war she could not enter Belgium until Hitler had already invaded. In one stroke, the whole of her Maginot Line strategy lay in fragments. Either she would have to meet the invading Germans somewhere on the defenceless Flemish plains, or prepare to meet them once again on French soil. Determined to avoid a battle on home soil, the French opted for the first of these two options, and led a mad dash into Belgium when the Germans invaded on May 10th, 1940. With less time to establish defences, they were only able to advance to a line centred on the River Deal and were unable to support Belgian defences on the Albert Canal. By the time the Allies properly arrived and dug in, however, their advance had been made redundant by their opponents driving three Panzer Corps through the Ardennes and across the Meuse at Sidon, Dinant and Montame. The rest, as they say, is history. Ultimately, what torpedoed the French plans for World War II was not the Maginot Line, which fulfilled its intended function of funneling the German attack into Belgium, it was the assumption that Panzer divisions couldn't go through the Ardennes. This was something the French had been warned about the previous year when Winston Churchill visited Paris informally in August 1939. Over lunch with General Georges, Deputy Commander-in-Chief of the French Army, Churchill argued that the Ardennes should not be assumed to be impassable and that the dense tree cover would offer German tank columns concealment from the air. The French High Command under Maurice Gamelin disagreed, but it wasn't unreasonable to do so, not least because it was incredibly risky for the Germans to pile into the Ardennes in the way they did. Not only did the Germans struggle with vast traffic jams, their tanks were also spotted several times by Allied air reconnaissance, though the reports were discounted as impossible by Gamelin. Had Allied bombers attacked the columns of tanks as they snaked their way through the forest, and had the Allies not sent their entire strategic reserve to the Netherlands, General Guderian's push through the Ardennes could have ended easily in disaster. When we talk about the Blitzkrieg of 1940, we sometimes forget that the German plan had its flaws just as the Allied ones did, and that Germany needed a hefty slice of luck to go with its boldness in order for the Panzers to succeed in such a dramatic fashion. As for the Maginot Line, if anything, France's mistake was not building more of it to cover the Ardennes. It was a sensible attempt at trying to contain a resurgent, remilitarised Germany, and if other parts of the plan had performed as intended, it may well have succeeded. France fell in 1940 for a variety of reasons. It was the perfect storm of German aggression and recklessness, 
and allied lethargy and incompetence on an operational and tactical level. The Maginot Line, however, did its job. It's a shame that others did not. As always, this video has been made possible by the support of my wonderful patrons, whose names you can see on the screen right now. If you liked this video and want to see more like it produced, then consider joining their ranks. Every dollar helps. Until next time, thank you all very much for watching this video on why the Maginot Line was actually a good idea, and I will see you all very soon for the next video.